Is it why? I mean, we're all thinking it. Like, I'm not going to say it. Good evening. The Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee will come back to order. Uh, we're going to be hearing two bills uh, this evening. The first one is going to be a brief reprise on Senate File 1336. Senator Herr, if you would come forward, please, as the chief author. For those of you who participated earlier this afternoon and were watching, this is the bill Senator Dibble, the co-author, presented on behalf of Senator Herr, who was convening a different proceeding at the time. Uh, Senator Dibble informed us after the fact that the matter should have gone to the floor instead of to the Transportation Committee. Um, so uh, what we're going to need to do is, uh, is reconsider the vote by which the bill was uh, sent to the Transportation Committee. Then once we have the bill back in front of us, I'm actually going to have an amendment to offer. Um, and I'm going to ask Senator Seberger to take over the gavel so that uh, we can do that proceeding. And I'll ask staff to hand out the amendment. Um, as we're getting started here, so we can be efficient. Okay. Madam Chair. Senator Letts. I move that the vote by which we uh, recommended Senate File 1336 to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Transportation Committee be re-referred or be reconsidered. All right. Uh, on Senator Latz's motion to reconsider the vote on Senate File 1336, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. So. We are now, we now have 1336 before us and we have the A3 amendment, I believe, Senator Latz. Yes, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to offer the A3 amendment and I'll explain it. Um, the A3 amendment uh, instructs the Commissioner of Public Safety to review the statutes and the rules and policies relating to reinstatement of driving privileges um, that uh, have been uh, revoked or withdrawn following a driving while impaired incident. Um, in particular, the intent is for the commissioner to focus on requirements that uh, inter needlessly interfere with the person's ability to reacquire driving privileges, such as requiring documents um, that are so old that it'd be practically impossible for someone to find them or get copies of them. And then secondly, to uh, look at the feasibility of a process by which um, the commissioner could waive any requirements that interfere with the uh, reinstatement of driving privileges under circumstances that might be appropriate in a particular case. Basically, it's just a study. Um, this is uh, and a report back to us with recommendations. Um, the uh, the, the uh, progeny or, or the, the, the derivation of this proposal uh, candidly, is a situation I'm aware of where a person hasn't had driving privileges in 25 years and is being asked to produce proof of insurance in three different years around 15 and 20 years ago. Um, there are other requirements that uh, um, are, are, might be hard to uh, meet but are entirely reasonable and appropriate, but those particular requirements are going to be nearly impossible to meet. Um, and in my judgment, they don't bear any relevance to the current uh, qualification to be able to drive safely if he meets the other requirements. Um, but the department has informed me that uh, the statutes and the rules are not waivable. They're simply there and there's nothing that can be done. So it seemed to me to work an injustice. And not only that, <clears throat> uh, to uh, consistent with other policies that we've tried to advance in this committee is uh, where we can get people valid and insured and licensed to drive on the roads. We're all better off we're all safer on the roads under those circumstances than having them drive uh, without a valid license and without insurance when they still have to get to work um, and so on. Uh, so uh, this would require a report and at least a first step in being able to analyze what might be done in circumstances uh, such as this. Uh, so I have spoken with the chair of the Transportation Committee, Senator Dibble. He is aware of this amendment. 
He supports it and has indicated that he does not need to see it in the Transportation Committee in order for it to go into this bill. Uh, this bill is an, kind of an omnibus policy bill that has a bunch of different provisions in it. So this amendment fits well within the scope of uh, Senate File 1336. And I understand Senator Hur is okay with it as well, but he can speak to that point. So I'd like to offer the A3 amendment. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Hur. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I, you know I uh, also want to express my appreciation for Senator Dibble for you know, earlier uh, spend time to present this bill, and uh, Senator um, both Senator Latz and Senator Dibble do see that there's a uh, opportunity or a room here to make this bill uh, more holistic, and so I'm open for that change and look forward after passes committee to. Uh, so get sent to the floor and, and get it passed there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Any discussion on the A3 amendment? Senator Cron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So this review is going to focus on identifying requirements that needlessly impede a person's ability to reacquire driving privileges. What, I guess my question is, what does needlessly mean and who gets to determine whether it's needless? Senator Lutz. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Cruen, uh, needlessly means what it means, which is uh, there's no particular need for enforcing a requirement any longer in that particular case. Um, doesn't advance any uh, public policy um, it becomes a, uh, a barrier that uh, doesn't serve any valid purpose any longer. But ultimately, uh, we're asking the commissioner to take a look at these things, and I think they'll interpret that however they think is appropriate when they provide a report back to us. Say, uh, we think these kind of requirements are, are, are still important, and they might say some other kinds of requirements are no longer important. Uh, we're just asking for a report back, and then we can figure out from there what, if anything, the legislature wants to do in terms of statutes or rules. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. If, you're, if we're asking the department to do a review of DWI cases, wouldn't there be a cost associated with that? Senator Latz. Uh, Sen uh, Madam Chair, Senator Kroon, uh, we have sent this over to the department. We've asked for their input. Um, we have not received any indication from them that there's going to be a cost uh, relating to staff time looking over their current statutes and rules. Um, so uh, if they tell us at some point there's a fiscal impact, then I guess we'll have to address that. Um, they did uh, review it and propose some language uh, adjustments which uh, have been jacketed um, and which will be dropped uh, shortly as a separate bill as well. And as far as I'm aware, they have not indicated any fiscal uh, requirements in order to conduct this review. So I think that's a long way of saying that uh, they can use their staff for this kind of review without charging the legislature an additional amount to do it. All right. Any further discussion on the A3 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. All right, to the bill, Senator Herr, uh, anything you'd like to add? No, I just want to thank you for giving this brief of time to uh, do the rightful duty and get this bill moving forward. All right, thank you, Senator Herr. Any further discussion on Senate File 1336 as amended? Senator Latz. Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 1336 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All right. Senator Latz has made his motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion prevails and the bill is headed to the floor. Congratulations, Senator Herr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Wickland's bill is up next.
All right, members, we have Senate File 1681 in front of us. Uh, in your packet, you will find the first engrossment of the bill. You will also find an A5 amendment, which is a delete everything amendment, and then you'll find an A6 amendment, which is an amendment to the A5 amendment. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll ask Senator Wickland uh, to walk us through what will be the a bill after the amendments are adopted. Um, and uh, um, I've been advised by council that most or all of these uh, 119 pages are within the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction portions of the uh, Health and Human Services uh, bill. Uh, that Senator Wickland is carrying. Um, so why don't we uh, just go ahead and, and have Senator Wickland describe the bill and you have some assistance from Senate Counsel's Office as well, I understand. So, Senator Wickland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I really appreciate that you're able to hear um, Senate File num um, 1681 tonight and, and be able to accommodate us. Um, we have provisions that um, are included in the Health and Human Services Omnibus that uh, needed to be heard in your committee. And, um, and so what I would like to do, um, if, if someone could move the A5 amendment, um, and then I'd like counsel to walk through the, the summary that you have to discuss the provisions that are in the bill. Yeah, Senator Wickland, uh, before we actually move the amendment, you can go ahead and describe it or have counsel describe it. And when you're done with that, okay. then we'll take the appropriate motions. Okay. Thanks. And do you want to start? Yeah. Let Ms. Stengel proceed. Ms. Stengel, go ahead and identify yourself, please, and proceed. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Lexi Stengel. I'm one of the counsel that works in the HHS area and will be sort of rotating through various people up here, um, and they'll introduce themselves as they come to the table. Um, we are going to do a high-level overview of the A5 Amendment, grouping sections together thematically. Um, if there are questions on individual sections, we're happy to try to answer those. So starting with Section 1, it removes the reasons for a disqualification from being public data and changes after that disqualification is affirmed, the reason for that disqualification, and the reason not to set aside the disqualification be private data rather than public data. Section 2 requires healthcare providers and health facilities to comply with the federal No Surprises Act, which requires sort of a um, truth in billing kind of concept. And this provides a complaint process for violations of the act, classifies data, and authorizes a civil penalty. Sections 3 through 17 are sort of a So, Ms. Stengel, um, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. This committee is, not, at least I'm not familiar with some of the shorthand that is used in Health and Human Services. So something like saying the No Surprises Act means nothing to me. If you could, uh, as you're going through this, maybe take some of those terms of art and give a little more explanation, that'd be helpful. Absolutely, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, and the department is here to provide um, further explanation on any of these if you need um, a lot more detail. So the No Surprises Act was a... Um, a relatively recent federal law that requires healthcare providers and health facilities to demonstrate the cost of care to their patients up front so there are no surprises when the, the patients are billed. Um, and this provision requires all of the healthcare providers and health facilities in Minnesota to comply with that um, and provide some additional parameters for how complaints are filed and resolved um, when a provider or facility violates that act. Um, and it goes through and classifies the various pieces of data that are part of that program um, and how those are handled. And then there's a civil penalty for um, a violation of that act. The next group of sections, sections 3 through 17, all have to do with um, transparency in drug prices. So there in state law is currently a Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act that requires what it sounds like, the prices of drugs needs to be posted um, and available. So these sections do a variety of things to provide additional transparency on different and new um, types of drugs. So uh, it requires a variety of places like PBMs and wholesalers and entities like that to identify um, 
to post information on certain classes of drugs on their um, available to the public. Uh, they have to report uh, on drugs that are identified as drugs of substantial public interest, and the department will identify what those drugs are. Um, there's a limit, I think it's several hundred of them can be identified. And then a reporting entity, if they don't provide all of these reports to the department as required on um, what they're doing with their drug prices, um, there's a civil penalty for that. Um, there are also um, manufacturer penalties for failing to submit timely reports as required, for failing to provide the necessary information or inaccurate information, or failing to comply with other um, provisions on the transparency provisions. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Hidala for the next sections. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nolan Hudala. I am nonpartisan Senate counsel for the HHS committee. I will pick it up at section 18, which begins on page 21, line one. Um, for the benefit of the com uh, committee, this comes from, the underlying language comes from Senate file 328, uh, which establish requirements for a prescription benefit tool um, and similarly a required prescription drug benefit transparency and disclosure. Uh, that section 18 defines key terms for the purposes of this section. Um, it further requires a manufacturer to report to the commission certain enumerated information for every drug with a wholesale acquisition cost of $100 or more for a 30-day supply or for a course of treatment more than 30 days. For the purposes of this specific committee, uh, that section provides that information reported in connection with this report is classified as public data, not on individuals, uh, and must not be classified by the manufacturer as trade secret information. That specific uh, line of information can be found in subdivision two, paragraph E, on that page 21. Sections 19 to 21 relate to a um, different underlying bill, that bill being Senate File 2002, uh, specifically the Healthcare Affordability Board. Uh, what the afford, uh, Healthcare Affordability Board does is to, it's set up to protect consumers state and local governments, health plan companies, providers, and other healthcare system stakeholders from unaffordable healthcare costs. And they do this through a variety of different mechanisms. Again, for the purposes of this board, uh, the board may request certain information from state agencies uh, and any data submitted to the board shall retain its original classification under the Minnesota Data Practices Act in chapter 13. Section 20, again, uh, relating to the Healthcare Affordability Board, which begins on page 24, line 21, requires that board to provide notice to all healthcare entities that have been identified by the board as exceeding the spending growth target for any given year. It provides that the board must establish and implement procedures to assist healthcare entities improve efficiency and further authorizes the board to implement performance Im uh, improvement plans. However, it uh, kind of takes it one step further and authorizes the board to impose a civil penalty if the board determines that the healthcare entity is unlikely to voluntarily comply with all applicable provisions of that subdivision. Section 21 also relates to the Healthcare Affordability Board and it requires the board to report to the legislature and submit written progress reports, including information on any civil penalties that it did in fact impose on healthcare entities. Uh, section 23 moves uh, onto a different bill, that bill being Senate File 1681. That begins on page 30, line three. Um, section 23, provides notice and disclosure requirements for healthcare entities engaging in a transfer of control transaction. In particular, it authorizes the Commissioner of Health and Attorney General to review and enjoin such transactions under certain circumstances 
most notably if those circumstances are adverse to the public interest. It provides for specific uh, sub and substantial limitations on nonprofit corporations formed under Chapter 317A, including review and enforcement of such transactions. Uh, finally, it authorizes the Attorney General or Commissioner to bring an action in District Court to compel compliance with the provisions of that subdivision or that section. And Mr. Chair, members, I'll take back over now for the next few sections. Ms. Stangle. Thank you. That takes us to Section 24 on page 37. Uh, and this section relates to long COVID and related conditions. And related conditions are defined to include myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, which is better known as ME-CFS, um, dysautonomia, and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, which are um, often related to long COVID. And this section requires the Commissioner of Health to um, establish a program to sort of track and monitor trends in COVID and these related conditions um, to look at the prevalence in certain areas to inform health professionals and citizens and to promote um, evidence-based practice around how to treat COVID and related conditions and finally to research and track um, these conditions. And in doing this, the commissioner um, can consult with a variety of people um, including Department of Human Services, local public health entities, insurers, um, and a whole variety of other people to, to work together and partner in these goals. The Commissioner of Health is also authorized to coordinate and collaborate with other organizations um, to make grants and contracts to perform this work. Section 25 starts on page 38, line 29. And this provision allows the Commissioner of Health to conduct fetal and infant death studies um, that will help them to look at planning and implementation, evaluating medical health and social services systems, and to um, reduce the number of preventable fetal and infant deaths in the state. Um, this a statute very similar to this was in place in the early 2000s, and um, I don't know if it was repealed or sunset, uh, but the idea is to bring um, this provision back. Subdivision 2, in particular, will be of interest to this committee starting on 39.3. And this allows um, access to data by the, the subject um, of the data. In this case, um, usually it's the mother of the infant that has passed away. Uh, the Commissioner of Health is required to have access to a variety of data, medical data, health records, um, data on social services, healthcare provider records. Um, and records from various state agencies to do this work. Um, subdivision 3 and 40.13 talks about how the commissioner, um, <clears throat> excuse me, manages all of the data that is collected related to these studies. Um, subdivision 4 on line 40.20 classifies the data um, depending on where it's coming from and whether it identifies uh, individuals. Section or subdivision five on 41.5 allows the commissioner of health to convene <laughs> case review committees to conduct death study reviews. Um, and this allows a variety of people to participate in these studies. And it talks about how the data collected by these review panels will be treated. The next section is section 26 on page 42, line 10. And this is the Healthy Beginnings, Healthy Families Act. Um, which overall is stated purpose is to build equitable, inclusive, and culturally and linguistically responsive systems to ensure health and well-being of young children and their families. And there are a variety of ways um, throughout this section to achieve those goals. One is in Subdivision 2, which is the Minnesota Perinatal Quality Collaborative, um, which works with a variety of partners to look at evidence-based information on health services, um, quality support access, all, all those sorts of things to improve outcomes for um, infants and babies. Throughout the section, there are a variety of grants that the commissioner and the department can authorize to a variety of places to really support the um, healthy babies and their, uh, whether they are um, the pregnant 
parents or through the um, child's young life. Uh, there is a partnership to prevent infant mortality um, that the Commissioner of Health establishes to look um, at best practices and sharing summary data on infant death and to promote policies to improve outcomes for young children. There are um, several screening tools that the department will develop and author and I'll, that's the word I'm looking for, offer for use to help screen young children at risk for developmental or behavioral concerns. And then starting on 46.6, there are several provisions here about model jail practices for incarcerated patients, which requires the Commissioner of Health um, to develop model practices to connect uh, children to parents or caretakers that are incarcerated and there are um, a grant to help um, with these programs and to connect the children with incarcerated parents. And then sections 27 through 30, which start on page 4711, amend the prescription monitoring system. So the prescription monitoring system requires dispensers to, pro to report certain information into the system so it's accessible um, to track who is being prescribed what. So this will specify when a dispenser is and is not required to submit data reporting. Um, it provides for destruction of data after a certain amount of time. There are some changes to access the data in the reporting system. And it, remo it moves this, the Board of Pharmacy into its own section and allows the board personnel to access data to conduct an investigation um, specifically related to a licensee or a registrant that uses the system. Uh, the board may also obtain data about utilization rates of the system. And then at the end of that, uh, section 30, it amends provisions relating to immunity from liability. And I think we'll do a quick staff change here, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Allie Hoffman Litchie with Senate Council. Um, I will take over starting with Section 31. Uh, Section 31 enhances the Financial Fraud and Abuse Investigations Program in the Department of Human Services um, by allowing the Commissioner for entities that are um, excluded from a program administered by the Commissioner um, to prohibit them from getting grant funding from any program also administered by the Commissioner. Uh, sections 32 to 33 and 38 and 68 transition the guardian and conservator background checks to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and keeps the maltreatment and licensing agency checks with DHS. Uh, sections 34 and 37 allow DHS to obtain Minnesota fingerprint-based criminal history records information for the Minnesota Sex Offender Program uh, from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Uh, this is in order to be in compliance with federal law. Uh, sections 35 and 36 clarify that data obtained by the Commissioner of Human Services to complete background studies is private data. Uh, section 39 makes data relating to the grant of a set-aside and data relating to the grant of a variance private data rather than public. Uh, sections 40, 42 to 47, and 49 to 57 implement an enhanced child protection response to reports of child sex trafficking by establishing a new non-caregiver sex trafficking assessment track. Section 41 modifies the definition of child in need of protection or services. Um, it adds language that clarifies that parents of children that are reported to an emergency department or a hospital setting due to mental health or a disability who cannot be safely discharged to their family and are unable to access necessary services should not be, should not be viewed as unable or unwilling to provide care unless there are other factors present. Uh, section 48 allows a report of suspected maltreatment to be made in the newly established provider licensing hub rather than just making an oral report. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I will pick up at section 58. Um, that can be located on page 78, line 17. Right, Mr. Hodel. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, this provision relates to the governor's easy enrollment language. In short, uh, the easy enrollment program is one where uh, individuals who are filing their taxes on an annual basis have a box that they can check, which would allow uh, certain data to be passed along to Mincher, which would then be able to determine their eligibility for certain subsidized state health care programs. Uh, that section provides that the commissioner may disclose a return or return information to the Mincher board if a taxpayer makes the designation under section 290.433 on an income tax return filed with a commissioner. The commissioner may only disclose data necessary to provide the taxpayer with information about the potential eligibility for financial assistance and health insurance enrollment options under section 62V.13, which is a section that relates to Mincher. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Uh, committee Ms. members, Hoffman -Litchie. I uh, will pick up. Uh, that's from sections 59 to 67. Those provision, they, those sections modify various child support enforcement provisions. Um, sections 69 and 70 modify collateral sanctions for general assistance, Minnesota Supplemental Aid, and the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Mr. Chair. Mr. Huddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, section 71 uh, relates to Senate File 1681, which, if you recall, uh, that relates to transfer of control of certain health care entities. Uh, this section of that bill extends the moratorium on for-profit health maintenance organizations uh, to the year 2026. Specifically, it requires such entities to maintain nonprofit status under Chapter 317A, which is our state's nonprofit entity chapter. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Ms. Hoffman Litchie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Com Mr. Chair, committee members, last but not least, uh, Section 72 is a repealer. It repeals statutory provisions that are related to the public law background studies. Um, these are no longer needed when DHS obtains fingerprint based criminal history records information from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. It also repeals a statutory provision that's related to legal non-licensed child care providers. All right, and then would you like to explain the uh, A6 amendment as well, which I understand were provisions that were uh, uh, similar in nature, just weren't included in the A5 when the A5 was put together? Correct. All right. So who wants to go through the A6? I will, Mr. Chair. Right. Ms. hoffman Uh Mr. Chair, committee members, the A6, uh, starting on line 1.4 through uh, 2.18, uh, this relates to sections 32, 33, 38, and 60 that are currently in the A5 amendment um, that transition the guardian and conservator background checks to the BCA. And it, this language is... Uh, erroneously omitted. And then uh, the rest of the amendment um, relates to other changes to Chapter 245C that are made to comply with federal law on data sharing related to background studies. Um, these provisions make changes to state law that required an individual to share reasons for disqualification with the provider. And they were just uh, missed when we were putting the A5 together. All right. Uh, so that's a lot to digest, members. Um, so let's just see if there are any uh, questions at the moment from members of the committee, and then we'll open up the floor to see if there's anyone else that wants to testify in connection with this. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, perhaps I have a question for counsel. Uh, as Which counsel, Senator Limmer? <laughs> How many Judiciary Committee Council or any of the multiple council in the audience here? Ms. Primo would do it. All right. Uh, Ms. Primo, uh, there's references on the A6 amendment as well as in the A5 that make reference to classifications of data. Um, you can see on lines 2.18 
uh, on the A6 amendment that certain data will be classified as private data uh, and that it simply stops. Is there a need to put some type of reference, uh, citation reference, to Chapter 13 wherever private data or a classification of data is referenced in new language? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, not necessarily. Um, those classifications appear in various statutes, um, both with a cross-reference to Chapter 13 and without. I'd say the general, um, I suppose, more modern trend is to include a cross-reference, but the meaning um, doesn't necessarily change. I believe in Chapter 13 there are there is language in there that there, that there are data classifications outside of Chapter 13, which are then um, informed by the definitions in Chapter 13. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the reason, the reason why I bring this up is that, oh, in uh, recent years, maybe the last five to eight years, um, we have made references to private data or, or any data, and we make that classification. And over time, uh, we begin to lose the importance of a citation. And um, in recent years, I know our Data Privacy um, Commission has recognized the need that we should probably make references to a specific citation to avoid confusion. And it also makes it easier for those who are practicing in this area they know exactly what our intent is. And so uh, I leave it up to the committee, but quite honestly, I, I don't think it hurts, and I think if we can make a reference to that point, I think it would be appropriate um, to continue that discipline where we can um, know exactly what we're referring to, even if there's a, uh, a reference over an entire chapter that we're discussing or putting into new law, I think it, it helps uh, practitioners in the future. Uh, so Senator Limmer, uh, I agree with you I, uh, for all those reasons. And one remedy here suggested by council is that you can make a motion to, uh, to make the statutory cross-reference as a technical correction uh, throughout the uh, A5 and A6 amendments, just giving direction to council to take care of that. Um, and then they can do it when they engross the next version. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move that and give, uh, give uh, license to the uh, council to make those uh, corrections, or not corrections, additions to that reference for the appropriate uh, area of law in Chapter 13 where it would apply. Ms. Primo, is there a particular language you would like us to use as the amendment here? Mr. Chair and members, um, not necessarily, but I suppose just so for transparency and so everyone's on the same page, but the, because this is um, language that's moving on in the HHS bill, so I think the intent would then be that um, those changes would be made here, but they would then be carried into the HHS omnibus and um, those cross-references would be included there, regardless of whether this is you know, passed out of committee or not. Senator Wicklund, your view on that amendment? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I would, I would accept that. I think if council is clear on the direction, um, I would see that as a way to bring consistency. So. So to uh, Senator Limmer's uh, proposed amendment um, that uh, council add the, the uh, cross-references to the uh, Chapter 13, appropriate Chapter 13 sections uh, throughout the A5 and the A6 amendment language. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Any further discussion on uh, the A5 or the A6 content? Senator Kroon. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to go back to the A5. Um, 
I'm reading page 40, 40.3 to somewhere around 40.9. <clears throat> it says that the commissioner must have access to all data described within the section without the consent of the subject of the data and without the consent of the parent or other guardian or legal representative of the subject data. And then in 40.7, it says the commissioner must make a good faith, reasonable effort to notify the subject of the data, parent, spouse, or other guardian, et cetera, before collecting data on the subject. What happens if the subject gets this notice and decides they don't want the commissioner to have this, sub this data? What happens in that situation? I think there are people who Senator are, are um, excuse me, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Kroon, there are people here from the Department of Health that could speak to, this is part of their proposal to reestablish the fetal and infant death studies. I think they could uh, summarize and answer more quickly than I could. Whoever wishes to answer the question, go ahead and identify yourself and proceed. Sure, I can. Hi, my name is Karen Fogg. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. And Senator, to Ms. answer Fogg. your question, um, we are proposing to reinstate the fetal and infant mortality reviews as um, a system that would be um, public health surveillance. We view this um, particular issue as uh, essential public health work to monitor the vital events um, in, these, in these children. So um, it is not an optional activity. Um, if these parents are already notified and offered grief support currently through a grant that we have with an organization, um, an organization that can connect them if they are willing or interested to grief support. So this would be an additional notification. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. There really is no purpose for the notice other than potentially to offer grief assistance. Is that right? Ms. Falk. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, um, we provide the similar sorts of um, notification in the maternal mortality or maternal death study statute. Um, and this is following the same, the same type of model where we feel that it's important that we, uh, we let them know that, they're, um, that the data is being accessed. And, um, we have found that many families feel that it's important that the a very painful experience in their life is being considered to think about recommendations for the future. That's the entire purpose of collecting this data so that we can look at um, strategies and recommendations to prevent future deaths. And many families feel that that's a very positive step um, that's taken out of a very painful time for their family. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, of course, some families might think that. Some families might not think that. And they may not want the government to have access to that data precisely because it was such a painful experience in their life. And I'm just struggling with what the purpose of notifying people are. If there's absolutely nothing they can do about it <coughs> once they get the notice. And it sounds like we're going to notify you that we're doing this, but there's nothing you can do about it. Is that right? Ms. Falk. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, that, that is correct that there's not an ability for the for a family member to, um, to ask us to not collect the data. Um, the concern that we have is that um, it's really important to have um, information that's representative of the entire population. Um, because these numbers are, are not you know, enormous. It's not like every, you know, that this is not every single person, that the number is small enough that if we lose some of that data, we lose the ability to, to talk about what has actually happened in our state and to have representative data information and recommendations moving forward. Senator Crump. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you have any data to suggest how many people would voluntarily agree with the... Um, the commissioner getting access, access to this data versus those that would object. Ms. Falk. 
Mr. Chair and Senator, I do not have data like that. Senator Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then how, how do you know whether it would make a difference in the studies if it's a very small percentage, a minuscule percentage that would want to opt out of this and not have their data used by the government? In those cases, it really wouldn't affect what you're trying to do here, would it? Ms. Fogg. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, I, I would argue that this is such an essential component of um, the Commissioner of Health's authorities and an essential part of our public health surveillance on vital events um, that it is a really crucial component um, that we continue to, to measure and, and try to collect information about why these deaths occurred. Senator Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's so important that it's critical to have 100% participation in it, even if against people's will, if that's what you're saying. Ms. Fogg. Mr. Chair and Senator, yes, that is what I'm saying, that this is essential data that we collect. Um, there's about 330 infants that die and about the same number of stillbirths or fetal deaths in the state. Um, it is essential for us as a state to understand why, why these events occur and to try to prevent them in the future. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I mean, I'm not denying that the data isn't important, but if we, we don't know how many would be like, yes, absolutely, versus those that say, I would really rather the government not have that data um, for whatever reason that individual has. Um, and without knowing that, it seems to me that it's a stretch to say that it's so fundamentally purpose of this that one or two that might decide they might not want to do it would disrupt the whole thing. It seems to me that we should get a handle on that information before we make it um, mandatory for everybody. Thanks. Is there any uh, further questions at this time from members of the committee? Uh, let me let me just ask before we go on, is there anyone else in the, uh, in the hearing room, uh, members of the public, that intend to uh, present some testimony here. All right. I see a few. So let's continue along this, this line of uh, uh, questioning, and then we'll open it up, and then we can go back to questions for follow-up so we have the benefit of all the input. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm triggered by Senator Kuhn, uh, Kruin's uh, line of questioning, and I'm kind of concerned about a lack of consent by individual citizens and um, we ask and recognize the right to consent in almost every other area of health uh, data requests and I don't understand why we wouldn't uh, recognize that opportunity for consent in this case that Senator Kroon has raised. Uh, isn't a sampling enough? Uh, even if it was a very large sampling, but to have 100% participation uh, deemed by the government to be the requirement, and nothing else is satisfactory to the Department of Health. This has been a pattern of the Department of Health for many years, and uh, I just don't understand why a, uh, a very large sample, 80%, 75%, wouldn't be adequate enough. So could you explain to me why that, that large of a sample would not be adequate enough to, for the Department of Health to draw conclusions? Because quite honestly, uh, this type of data is very personal, very intimate, and there are some people that just don't want to give that information up regarding their own selves. They believe in the autonomy of the individual but somehow the Department of Health doesn't seem to recognize that same degree of autonomy. Ms. Falk. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, um, so on the issue of consent, this, um, this data also follows the same uh, model that um, the Maternal Mortality Review um, Committee uses in the Maternal Death Study Statute. It also follows similar language from the Child Maltreatment Review process, which looks at um, child deaths related to maltreatment. Um, and both of those have the same, the same kind of um, language. Um, and I think this follows that same pattern. I will also say that this, um, 
this uh, process, the what's called the fetal and infant mortality review process, is a national standard um, with a national model. And so what we're suggesting here is not out, of a, not out of alignment with both what we're doing in the state to look at other deaths and what is happening nationally. Mr. Chair, I, I do Lund. have uh, some questions on another area of the bill. Would um, you want me to hold until we hear testimony? Yeah, I, I think maybe right. because some of your questions might be answered by some of the testimony as well. But uh, while we're on this topic, um, I have a couple follow-up questions. First of all, is this is this data that is collected? Um, is it separated from identification of the, uh, uh, the 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 person or family? Is it anonymized data, or how is that collected? How is it stored? Um, thank That's you, fine. Mr. Chair. the The data is collected um, through records of various sorts, and um, the personally identifiable information is removed. So we take the what would be like a medical record, and we abstract the information that that is needed for what what is called a case summary. That case summary is actually what others see beyond that abstractor. Um, names are removed, often locations are removed, um, to try to anonymize that case that case narrative. The review committee itself um, would see that case narrative and then be able to make recommendations for prevention of future for future deaths, um, similar to that case, based on that anonymized narrative. Um, we try to take things out that are both personally identifiable information, um, but also things to prevent bias or, or remediate bias of the committee review members. Um, that could be location or other things. Um, the data is uh, stored, uh, the, the case narratives are, are stored in compliance with the data privacy laws in the state. We have experience with the maternal mortality review that also sees similar data um, and, and you know health records and that kind of thing and we take the storage and, um, and records retention extremely seriously, recognizing as the Senator has noted that this is private, um, this is very personal data um, that people want to protect, and we take that um, with the utmost seriousness. And, and then also related to that, if you were to get 75 or 80 percent of the cases, um, but not 100 percent, would that have any impact on the statistical validity of the overall data that you're trying to extrapolate from to look for patterns or trends? Ms. Falk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do think that is the case. One of the biggest concerns is looking at um, disparities by race and ethnicity here in the state. Um, infants that are, that are um, born to American Indian mothers and infants that are born to um, black mothers here in the state unfortunately have disproportionate um, fetal and infant death rates compared to their white counterparts. And those numbers are small in many communities. And so if we don't get enough of those, those um, deaths as part of the overall sample, we, can all, we cannot make specific um, summary data available about, the, about those cases. We can't make specific recommendations available about, about those cases and those dis health disparities um, between communities are extremely important to us. And we'd like to be able to provide uh, useful, actionable data, um, summary data, ex um, publicly available and summary recommendations out of this process. I would also think if there was any common feature among the demographic that would decline to provide data if they had that option, you wouldn't even be able to recognize that or any patterns within that group because you didn't, you would not have gotten the data to be able to analyze it, right? Uh, yes, Mr. Sorry. Chair, that's, that's correct. Um, all right, so why don't we uh, pause the committee questioning now and take any other public testimony and then we'll reopen the committee questioning. Um, I have on here a is, is it Mr. Ms. Ms. Conti from the Attorney General's office. No? Ms. Conti is available. Um, Mr. Available Chair, to answer questions? Uh, answer questions, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I saw two other hands go up. I saw Mr. Lehman's hand go up, and I saw this gentleman's hand go up. Mr. Lehman, uh, whichever, if you both want to come on forward, that's fine. Mr. Lehman, go ahead and identify yourself for the record and who you represent and give us your testimony. 
Cer certainly, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Latz and, and members. My name is Tom Lehman. I'm here this evening on behalf of Prairie Care, uh, which is the Minnesota's largest provider of child and adolescent mental health services. It has a 76 psychiatric bed hospital in, in uh, Brooklyn Park and other locations, both in the metro and outstate. It's unique because it's one of just two for-profit hospitals in Minnesota. The other one is Regency Hospital in Golden Valley, which is a long-term care hospital for medically acute ventilator-dependent patients. Both are specialty hospitals with services that other hospitals, frankly, don't want to provide um, because of low reimbursement rates from both public and private payers. Last year, Prairie Care, um, due to circumstances beyond its control, had to find a buyer uh, willing to invest in mental health in Minnesota. Failing to find a buyer would have been devastating for the thousands of patients that Prairie Care serves every year. Thankfully, a company called Newport Health stepped up and bought Prairie Care. Newport's a national provider of mental health and chemical dependency services in a residential setting for, for uh, youth and young adults. They had recently established a presence in Minnesota because they had purchased the, uh, at that time, closed down uh, St. Cloud Children's Home um, and transformed that into a state-of-the-art residential treatment facility for adolescents. And they'd also invested in several other group um, residential facilities. Continued investment and expansion of mental health services and chemical dependency services at a time of critical provider shortages and increasing demand is good news for Minnesota's patients and good news for our communities. I'm sure all of you have received calls from constituents. Um, if you're new and you haven't gotten a call yet, you will at some point get a call from a constituent saying, my kid's in crisis, my kid needs help, what am I supposed to do? Um, if the financial transaction provisions in section 23, and I just ask you to open up your, the amendment, the A5 amendment to page 30, because I want to reference several things starting in, um, in section 23. But if these provisions had been uh, law last year, Newport Healthcare probably uh, would have had to reconsider its investment in Minnesota due to the burdensome, timely, and ultimately uncertain review and approval process that this provides. Further, the broad reaching provisions of section 23 could impact Newport's operations in other states, as it could make it more difficult for Newport to raise capital or invest in other healthcare entities. And here where I just, I'd like to refer to the bill just for a moment. It defines, Newport meets the definition on page 31, line one. At the top of the page is an entity that owns or exercises control over another entity because they, they bought Prairie Care, which is defined on, on, on the previous page. If you drop down to page 31.27, it defines a transaction as an action or a series of actions within a five-year period that constitutes, and then it goes on to list a number of things. And then on page 32.21, it says this subdivision applies to all transactions where the healthcare entity involved in the transaction has an average revenue of at least $40 million a year. Newport has well over $40 million a year. So every transaction, as we read this, that Newport is involved in, and they're involved in 11 states, Mr. Chair and members, the transactions that they're involved with in California, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, other states where they are involved in healthcare transactions, as we read this, would be subject to the review of the Attorney General of Minnesota and the Commissioner of Health. And going on to, to uh, page 36, line 24, our Attorney General will consult with the Commissioner to determine whether transaction is contrary to the public interest. Now, I've, I've known our Attorney General for a number of years. Uh, he's very bright, much brighter than I, which is not a tough benchmark to beat, but he's, he's a very bright guy. But I'm frankly not confident he has the ability to, to consider transactions in California or Connecticut and determine if they're in the public interest. So I just, I just want to flag that. Just a couple more points, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for your patience. There's, there's not a stampede of investors rushing to Minnesota to expand our mental health and chemical dependency services. As you know, there's a shortage. That's, and, and it's because of the poor payments from public payers and private payers. And that's a major reason 
for the severe shortage of mental health providers and, and mental health access that we have in the state. And in partial response to these challenges, last year, members will remember who were here last year, the legislature passed legislation that waives the hospital moratorium law from August 1st of 2022 to July 31st of 2027 for expanding mental health services in an effort to encourage people to come into this, to, to this market. How do, how do we get more people in? Let's reduce the barriers to entry. And that bill specifically that was passed last year exempts the acquisition of an existing psychiatric hospital, the construction of a new psychiatric hospital, or the expansion of an existing inpatient health care unit. So the law last year said, let's, let's remove some of the burdens to expanding mental health services. That's good. But now Section 23 seeks to reverse the course that the legislature set just less than 12 months ago. It takes a step backward from expediting new mental health investments without state regulatory processes to creating a whole new regulatory process for mental health investments. And I fear that this sends a very negative signal both to potential investors in Minnesota and out of Minnesota of whether this is a good place to expand mental health services. Finally, Mr. Chair, I just want to say I appreciate it. I've had multiple conversations with, with Chair Wickland, including uh, email exchanges over the break. Um, she's been very generous with her time, as always. Um, and I'm just hopeful that we can reach an agreement that provides the greater oversight that she's looking for. And I understand her interest in, 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 in getting that oversight. But we do that in a way that does not harm current and future mental health patients in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. Uh, sir, go ahead and identify yourself and your affiliation and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joe Selwood with Cook Strong Selwood, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Association for Accessible Medicines, uh, the leading trade association for the manufacturers of generic and biosimilar medicines. AAM opposes Section 18 of the A5 Amendment, uh, and I won't repeat the generic supply chain information provided earlier today by my colleague, Ms. Cook. Section 18 includes significant new reporting requirements, price controls, and penalties, uh, each of which may extend beyond the drugs they are intended to capture. Subdivision 2 requires generic manufacturers to report by July 31st every drug with a wholesale acquisition cost of $100 or more, and states on line 21.15 as applicable to the next calendar year. Reporting the price of a generic drug in the middle of the year for the next calendar year is not reasonable and likely cannot be done. The competitive generic market is dynamic and needs the ability to react. It's not clear if a price change is a failure to report and if it could result in a $10,000 penalty. Subdivision 4 then creates a link between the drugs reported to the Department of Health under Subdivision 2 and drugs included on a, formulary sub on a drug formulary submitted to the Department of Commerce under Section 62A.02. Drugs that check both boxes are then placed under new rules. They can increase the wholesale acquisition cost for the next calendar year, but only after providing 90 days advance notice. Failure to meet this requirement could result in a $10,000 penalty for each separate violation. What remains unclear is how subdivision four impacts a generic drug with multiple manufacturers. As written, it appears that all generic manufacturers of a drug subject to the price control even those uh, generic manufacturers with significantly reduced or declining prices. And furthermore, it does not require the drug to ever be sold or dispensed in the state of Minnesota, yet they would still face significant penalties. And this is on top of the penalties in other legislation being considered this session. AAM shares the goal of lowering drug prices and our members work to make that a reality, but this language will have the opposite effect. Please support low-cost generic drugs and oppose Section 18. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, members, I'm going to note that Section 18 of the bill that Mr. Sullivan testified to is included as a 
for purposes of the Judiciary Committee's consideration because of the language starting on line 21.29 and continuing on the next page, which classifies the information reported under that subdivision as public data. So it's the data provision that is really the focus of this committee, not the underlying policy. Um, I do have a follow-up question relating to Mr. Lehman's testimony, and this might be a question for uh, Ms. Conti from the Attorney General's office, but uh, I guess, Senator Wicklund, maybe you can, if you're not able to answer it, you can direct us in the right place. Um, the, uh, the, the second concern raised by Mr. Lehman, as I understood it, was a suggestion that the language on, on line 32.20 and continuing from there, basically brought in any transaction anywhere in the country involving an entity uh, that, um, I guess, owns a Minnesota health care provider. It's the impression that I'm getting is I'd like to know if, if that's the way you interpret this language, Senator Wickland, or, or if this is something that the Attorney General's office would be or some other counsel would be in a position to answer. Senator Wickland. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I had not heard that extension that, you know, transactions outside of what we're trying to get at, of course, there are transactions in Minnesota that could affect Minnesotans and their access to health care. And so I, I don't know if the Attorney General's office would have any other further comment on that. Um, I would say that this is language that I have been working on, and we have, we have made several modifications to as it's gone through the other committee process. But maybe Ms. Conti can address the, this question. Ms. Conti, go ahead and identify yourself. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Erin Conti. I'm an assistant attorney general. Um, and no, we do not believe that Mr. Lehman's um, concerns are, are a valid reflection of the law. Uh, or its intent. So, um, so it is, I'm struggling at this hour of the evening to think of another area of statute where we specifically call out that the Attorney General's enforcement is limited to um, enforcing a particular statute within the state of Minnesota. That is sort of baked into how we enforce the law. There are jurisdictional hurdles that we need to kind of cross in any case, or clear in any case. Um, and, and no, we would not anticipate that we would be reviewing every transaction that a multi-state actor is, is engaging in. We are looking at transactions affecting Minnesota healthcare entities. Uh, Ms. Conti, I, I believe Mr. Lehman noted the definition of transaction that's on line 31.27, doesn't limit the transactions to the state of Minnesota, although I guess I would have inferred that was the case. Um, and then he jumps to 32.20 where it refers to transactions, again, without an explicit limitation. Um, but what you're saying is that your interpretation of this, of the way this whole this whole provision would apply is that it would only apply to transactions involving that occur in Minnesota or involving Minnesota health care facility, or how would you state that? In, involving health care entities in Minnesota, yes, that is that is our interpretation. If, if there were some ambiguity in the statute in that regard, how would you suggest clarifying that ambiguity? Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, and members, I would need to circle back to the committee on that point in the, I think we're at five plus committee hearings we have had on this language at this point in time. This is a novel question uh, to us. We have not heard others raise concerns about purely out of state transactions. Um, and I, would hesitate to suggest an amendment to address it just off on the fly at this moment. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that. And 
And I can think of something that would take care of it just within the confines of the definition of transaction, but there may be some language somewhere else where it would be more broadly applicable that would uh, that would clarify it in a better way in an area of the statute I'm not as familiar with. I, mean, I think it'd be a simple matter to, within the definition of transaction, add a provision that says it only applies to healthcare entities located in Minnesota or something to that effect. But um, I, I would uh, appreciate if you give some thought to how it might be best incorporated there so there isn't any doubt about that. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Conti. the you know, as as we're looking at this, there are a couple of carve outs placed um, around thirty two sixteen. Um, and I wonder whether um, or after thirty two nineteen um whether it would make sense to introduce language saying that it, a transaction does not include acquisition of an entity um, outside of the state of Minnesota. Or acquisition, transfer of control, et cetera. Ms. Conti, I see we have other council thinking about this question too. Um, but what if you um, on uh, line uh, thirty-one point? I'll let you guys talk about it. I won't talk over you. Go ahead. Have your conversation, then we'll benefit from it. So our proposal would just be with the definition of transaction means a single action or series of actions within a five-year period, um, which, incurs, which occurs entirely within the state of Minnesota, which predominantly occurs within the state of Minnesota. Um, even, even a part of it has to occur in the state of Minnesota. Mr. Chair, Senator Wickland. Mr. Mr. Hodala has a, a suggestion for Mr. a rural amendment. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, the oral amendment would read uh, page 31, line 27, after uh, period, uh, insert, which occurs in part within the state of Minnesota. So we were uh, noodling over some very similar language here as well. Um, and uh, 
I think that might cover it. Senator Wicklund, to address this concern, would you like us to add that language to the bill? Um, Mr. Chair, yes, if, if we could address that, I would appreciate it. All right. uh, Senator Westland moves um, that on line 31.27, after the word period insert, which occurs in part within the state of Minnesota. Any further discussion on this amendment? Not seeing any. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Thank you for scribing that on the spot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there any further public testimony? Um, or discussion from members of the committee questions. I know Senator Limmer had a question he was holding on from, to from earlier. Uh, Mr. Lehman, if there was something else that you thought we could address, um, or um, Mr. Sawood, uh, if you think there's something else we can address while still accomplishing the purposes of the bill uh, that Senator Wickland seeks to improve, happy to consider that as well. Mr. Lehman. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to turn that opportunity down. <laughs> well, if, if, if you um, think there's it, something we can fix here and now. Per perhaps. I, I, I didn't go through all the concerns in, in this section. And as, and as Ms. Cook said this afternoon, I'm not a lawyer, but I try real hard. And I, just, I just want to quote her on that. That seems to be a common theme today. I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> um, but, but another... You've another... got to bring in the Board of Law, someone to go after lawyer people. But another concern, lawyers. another concern, Mr. Chairman, again, Tom Lehman speaking for Prairie Care. Um, just another, another line that just jumps off the page that raises concern is on 32.8. Again, Prairie Care has, was purchased by Newport Health. Newport Health is in multiple states. It's a for-profit corporation. If they were to merge with someone or be acquired by someone and that, that process results in a new entity, does that trigger all the notice requirements that uh, would have to be provided to the Attorney General? Because again, Newport has a presence in Minnesota. I appreciate very much, Madam, Mr. Chair and, and, and Senator Wicklund and members of the committee for the amendment you just did. Um, but what would be the impact of Newport being bought or merging with someone, creating a new entity? Does that trigger all these additional notice requirements? Because that, that, that. Well, so the, the, you're asking a question of interpretation. So let's right. ask the bill's author if they would interpret that. And then the second question would be maybe that's what they want to do anyway. But let's ask, answer the first question first. Yeah. Senator Wickland. Mr. Chair, I don't know if Ms. Conti would have any comment on this particular. Um, I think there could be a case where something is created. I'm not sure if it's as easily as re resolved that, you know, creation of a new healthcare entity is, is not something we'd want to take into consideration. But um, trying to think of a um, more detailed answer to that. I don't know if Ms. Conti's I mean, Conti coming forward. I mean, I understand what you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, it's but. Ms. Conti. Mr. Chair and members, Mr. Lehman may not be a lawyer, but this feels very much like the hypotheticals that young law students tend to engage in. <laughs> Um, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank at you. this moment, um, <laughs> I, I hesitate to answer whether a hypothetical entity may be you know, acquiring or may be investing in or may be being invested by uh, or from um, Prairie Care would trigger the, the review process envisioned here. It is possible, but given that rather vague cloud, I guess I don't know. 
Is it possible that you know some threshold of investment would be crossed affecting a Minnesota healthcare entity? Maybe, I guess, in hideous law student banter fashion, I would have to also say I would need to know more before I can give a full answer to that. Fair enough, Ms. Conte. Mr. Mr. Chair, Layman. I'll, I'll just say, I'll take that as a compliment, Ms. Conte, but Newport and Prairie Care are not hypothetical corporations. They are corporations present in Minnesota today that serve constituents of every legislator on this panel. They serve constituents who are in every county in the state of Minnesota. Majority of them are on Medicaid, uh, covered by DHS. So I, I just, I have, well, I'm sorry, well, it's a little concerned with saying that they're hypothetical. Well, These are real no, people with real problems. No, I, I, Mr. Lehman, I don't think Ms. Conti is suggesting anything to the contrary, but uh, we're trying to apply proposed statutory language to a situation that none of us have a whole lot of detail about other than you, who knows a lot more about it. Um, but my own interpretation of this is if, if a proposed acquisition of a large national organization of a Minnesota healthcare entity crosses a certain threshold, whether it creates a new healthcare entity or whether it meets the $40 million per year thresholds or whatever, I think the idea is then, yes, it would trigger some notice and review requirements to make sure it's in Minnesotans' best interest for that to occur. I think that's the whole point of the bill, if I understand it. But Ms. Conte, you're, you're kind of... Yes, Mr. Chair and members, and again, I think we, we have now orally amended this to provide some additional comfort. The traditional notions of jurisdiction um, and other limitations are here. I, this is not drafted with the intent, nor does I think it have the effect of applying to things that are really outside of Minnesota's borders. And again, when we're talking about specific hospitals that already exist here, when we are talking about entities like Prairie Care, yes, investments in something like a Prairie Care would be subject to this review, and that is the intent of the bill, is to look at healthcare entities that exist in Minnesota when control over them changes. Yes, that would fall within the review. That's the concern. So that question, That's a concern, Mr. Chairman. I understand Prairie Care is concerned. Uh, candidly, I'm more concerned about some national company coming in and doing something that's going to be detrimental to the to Minnesotans, and at least that's the purpose of yeah. the Attorney General's review in this kind of a situation. So perhaps the review would result in no concern whatsoever, um, or maybe the saving of an institution that provides care such as Prairie Care provides, and it would be a net benefit for Minnesota. Uh, but the question here is whether the Attorney General's office should have the ability to review it. Uh, so uh, we're also, I think, beyond this, getting a little bit beyond Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction on, on this bill anyway. But uh, to this point, Senator Kroon, and then I'll go back to Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patiently. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to point out that this committee thrives on hypotheticals. We do it all the time. And so I don't see anything wrong about in, engaging in, in an important hypothetical like this. And I guess my question would just be um, whether the process of this review by the Attorney General, how that might impact not the ultimate conclusion of the Attorney General, but the process that is set forth in this bill, how that might interfere fear with a merger or a sale or the things that you're talking about. Senator Wicklund. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kroon, I mean, I, I think that sort of uh, speaks to what potentially could happen, and I'm, I think it's hard to, I could see, you know, impact happening to a transaction because, but then I also, how would we ever decide to do anything, or you know, how would we take action to review um, important transactions like this if we're always thinking about, well, would this inhibit something from taking place? Um, I don't know, Ms. Conti, if it would So it'd be a barrier to entry, but it's a barrier worth establishing so we can protect the interests of Minnesotans. I believe, Is that um, what you're suggesting, Senator? Mr. Chair, yes, I'd say that 
there is, yeah, it would be a barrier to entry, but I also think that businesses have a lot of um, abilities to determine how they want, how they wish to run their business and perform transactions, and uh, we need to make sure that the public is amply protected from, um, you know, transactions that might be, might not be in the interest of Minnesotans and their access to health care. Senator Limmer or Senator Krohn, a follow-up on that? Yeah. Thank you, you Mr. Can Chair. fight Senator Limmer for the mic. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to determine is how big of a barrier it is, whether it's impossible. So I'm ask, actually asking for your perspective on what the, the potential sale. Yes. Uh, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Um, you Are you directing your comment to Mr. Lehman? I can't see who you're looking yes, at from here. Yes, I'm sorry. Senator Krohn. Yes. All right. um, the practical implications, whether this barrier to entry, as we're calling it, what the practical implications of this bill and the process would be um, for a sale or a merger that you had previously discussed. That, that was my question. Um, Mr. Chairman and, and Senator, that, that's, that's an excellent question. And again, Newport's response to that specifically is that if this had been in effect last year, they won't say that they wouldn't have invested, but they would perhaps take another look to determine, because of the time delays in here and the ability to um, review the information that has to be provided, um, the, the look back period um, is just very troubling from a business perspective to have to you know, normally in business, company A wants to buy company B, and it, you know, they shake hands and it's done. This is at least a six-month process that the Attorney General decides to get involved in. At that point, the, you know, the, the time may have passed. Mr. Chair. Senator Wicklund. Um, I just I would like to point out that, that this isn't, um, that this process is established and set up in, in many states. I, Ms. Conti's pointed out that in 29 states have similar um, sort of review processes and those states have differing periods of time that they um, the the review process has to or the notification timeline um, varies from uh, 30 day to 120 days and we've um, we've changed the bill to be a 90 day notice so I mean we are making changes um, as the bill moves forward but I don't think it can be claimed that this is you know, far, far out in terms of a process, a review process, as compared to what is required in other states. Senator Limmer. Thank you. Um, I've uh, written down a number of questions that I'd like to ask. Uh, the first question is, is uh, we've made a lot of references in a number of bills giving uh, the Attorney General access to perform action uh, on a variety of different issues. And I just wanted a question. Doesn't the Attorney General have a blanket authority anyway to do that? Do we have to write it into bills? Uh, I'm trying to recall that and what the authority of the Attorney General is. So could maybe counsel tell me if the AG has blanket authority to review and pursue civil action on a variety of issues, or does it need specific permission from the legislature to do so? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, the AG has broad inherent authority, but when it comes to um, overseeing the various transactions of corporations or specifically nonprofits, there are specific um, provisions in Chapter 317A and Chapter 501B, and yes, under the uh, there is a specific 45-day waiting period with a 30-day extension, but this would um, add more to that current authority in terms of what the notice would require, and um, there's also a public interest standard in here, uh, which isn't in our current. Um, law in 317A 
Um, so it's, it's a broadening of what is already generally required in some form in um, our current statutes. Okay. Uh, Senator Limmer. Senator Latz, uh, thank you. Uh, I notice on page 38 and 42 there's a purpose statement uh, that are in both pages. They're different, slightly different. Um, we traditionally don't put purpose statements into our statutes, and I was wondering why we have purpose statements in this bill. Yeah. <laughs> Pages 38 and 42 you're referring to, Senator? That's right. So section 25, subdivision 1. Is there a second, uh, Mr. Chair, a second one also? Uh, page 38 and 42. Um. So, Senator Wickland, can you tell us, or can Council tell us, what the substantive value of those purpose statements is? It looks like under section 25, page 38 and 39, that paragraph B has a substantive purpose, I'm trying to determine if paragraph A has a substantive uh, reason for existing, other than sort of a value statement, which I agree with Senator Limmer, we frown on that in Judiciary Committee, at least. In the Senate, we've kind of frowned on that. So, Senator Limmer, I'm looking at uh, section 25, at least on page 38. I'm not sure it's properly called a purpose statement. If you read the actual language, it seems to authorize the conduct, conducting a study and identifying what the study would cover. I would agree, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I maybe what needs to be changed, <laughs> just delete the term purpose, because it's not really a purpose statement. Right. Senator Wickland, Ms. Stengel, what do you think about that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I yeah, I, I, I thought perhaps that that Clause A maybe wasn't doing a whole lot, but if you think it does, I do think that Clause B is important. There, the, the, that starts on 39.1, because that, Seems to indicate that it, you know, that it's not supposed to expire. So I don't think we'd want to remove that. But if there's if there's no reason for that other clause A, um, or if it needs to be re-termed, I guess it, um, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I don't. Ms. Stangle, does clause A need to exist to give the commissioner the authority to conduct those studies? Um, Mr. Chair and members, I think paragraph A on 3830 um, doesn't provide any sort of legal operative language. If you look down in the subsequent subdivisions, that's where it tells them that they have access to data and what they shall do with that data and how the data is classified. Um, but to Senator Wickland's point, I do think paragraph B on 39, 1 and 2 um, is necessary because it specifies that they shall not expire. All right, so 
Council Stengel, how would you suggest an amendment here to delete paragraph A, delete the word purpose, um, and uh, on line 39.1, delete parenthetical B, so you, maybe you just have subdivision 1 without the parentheses A and B, it just says notwithstanding any other, any other law to the contrary, et cetera? Um. Mr. Chair and members, if you're willing to be a little more creative with your motion, I think you could delete subdivision one entirely and instruct staff to move the language about um, the committee not expiring. Um, usually that sort of appears at the end of these sorts of things. There's sort of an expiration subdivision. Um, so you could move, instruct staff to move uh, a new subdivision after 42 line 9 would you be a new subdivision to say something to the effect of um, the provisions in this subdivision do not expire or something to that effect. It just seems sort of odd to have that at the very beginning. Senator Limmer, is that what you'd like to do? Yes, Mr. Chair. So do we need any more clarification with regard to the motion? To amend? Does council understand what's intended here? All right, Senator Limmer so moves. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Limmer, you also brought up the other uh, so called purpose statement beginning at line 4211. Is that correct? That's correct. To me, anyway, that looks completely like a values statement, and it's properly titled purpose, but it doesn't have any legal operative right. value, as Ms. Stengel described it. Senator Wicklund, Ms. Stengel, what do you think? I, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would agree that it, it doesn't seem like it, you know, it doesn't help them understand or define what is allowed. It just describes some. I, if if that's not um, something that we normally include when we're writing these kinds of bills, I'd be open to removing, removing that. It sounds like a good opening statement to support the reason to vote for the provision, but not something we put in statute as an operative yeah. language. Uh, Ms. Stangle, would you concur from a legal standpoint as counsel? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do agree. Senator Limmer, do you Chair. move to delete subdivision one there? Uh, yes, uh, lines 42, 11 through 17. And renumber the subsequent renumber subdivisions accordingly. Subdivision. Any further discussion regarding that proposed amendment? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we haven't had a lot of discussion about jail practices. I was wondering if the author or someone from the department could just give me a 30,000 foot elevation description of what are we trying to do uh, by affecting jail practices. I'm a little confused about where we're going on that. Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Limber, are, are you on like page 40? Six is that uh, where you're, you're looking? Yeah. At well, it's, yes. It starts on 46. I'm not, um, um, wondering if the Department of Health, if they have a subject matter expert on the health beginnings. Senator Wickland is requesting the Department of Health to come forward and answer this question. Good evening. Um, my name is Anna Lynn. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, Go ahead, Ms. Lynn. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, we are working out of a, um, a document that comes from the National Institute of Corrections that has outlined a whole array of model jail practices to support children of incarcerated parents, and we're working with jails to implement those, excuse me, 
So I can tell you about some of those if you'd like. Um, so some of the examples of jail practices include things like intake and including questions about parent status at the intake. Um, visiting practices like having priority family time for visiting or um, having um, opportunities for extended visit visiting hours for families, for children and their parents. Um, it might include things like um, policies around um, the information that they have on their website. There's just a whole range of practices that are included. Um, it includes things like what kinds of partnerships they make with the community and how they engage in those partnerships. Um, so there's a range of practices. I could continue if you. Sure. Senator Lemmer. Uh, I noticed on lines 46.7, there's a reference to implement model jail practices, and that's what caught my attention, uh, as in what model jail practices? Who's authoring? authorizing or authoring those model jail practices. I'm sure there's quite a number of, of entities out there that have their own brand of model jail practices. And this seems to have a lack of uh, direction on what that exactly would be. And I'm kind of surprised that the Department of Corrections, do they have model jail practices involving children and building a relationship between their parents that might be sitting in prison or in jail for that matter. And uh, so uh, you made reference to one particular organization that has model jail practices, but is that the best one? And we kind of don't know the way this is written. Ms. Lund. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair and um, Senator, thanks for the question. Um, the, we work closely with the Department of Corrections. To my knowledge, they don't have an outline of their model practices. They are doing some work to change some of their policies and practices and, and way they're engaging parents. Um, this National Institute of Corrections document that we're really like referencing and, and centering our work around was created by a, a group of national experts, including several from Minnesota, um, a sheriff from Washington County and university expert in um, supporting children and families in, with, uh, involved in corrections. Um, and so I don't know it's sort of right now considered the reference tool for model practices for families in, with you know, incarcerated parents. Um, I'm sure that will continually evolve. Do you want to? Mr. Sure. Chair. Oh, uh, Mr. Senator Chair. Wicklund. Senator Weckland. Senator Lever, are you, um, so I, I see on, on line 46.11, you know, it, it has a, um, a paragraph that talks about defining, you know, mod model jail practices, what that means. Are you um, requesting that that have more definition in terms of who, where those practices come from or who, you know, who has developed them? Is that what you would like to see? Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Lummer. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was just trying to find uh, a little bit more definition of what these would be in a little more specificity. And uh, the other question I did want to know is, has the Minnesota Sheriff's Association endorsed this, this direction? Uh, Ms. Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator. Yes, um, in fact, uh, Bill Hudson, or um, I'm terrible with names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> he, he was on the committee. Um, he was the sheriff in Washington County that was part of the, the work that laid out uh, this National Institute of Corrections document that we're referencing. And he was the former executive director of Minnesota Sheriff's Association. 
um, and has supported this effort continuously throughout the process. That's actually how we identified the current jails that are involved was through MSA, so. Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in looking at the list of activities or parameters, let's call it, 46.20 uh, down to 28, um, it's all kind of uh, recognizing uh, the direction for a healthy relationship between the child and perhaps her parents that may have made some serious mistakes in their life and now they're sitting in jail. Um, I don't see any reference to the department trying to recognize the possibility that bringing a child to a specific parent might be an unhealthy uh, avenue. Uh, a parent might be abusive. Uh, a parent might be uh, a sex offender where the child is uh, a target. And I certainly wouldn't want us to try and force a relationship uh, with good intentions, but there hasn't been an analysis of that. So is there some assurance that that is not going to happen in this bill? Yeah, I can. Ms. Fogg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, thanks for that important question. That would certainly be, be a concern, and there's not any interest um, on the department in putting children in harm's right. way. The way that we have um, a program currently funded by federal dollars to do this work um, in six, um, six sites here in Minnesota, um, the program is, and we would continue to replicate this kind of program under this um, statute, um, that it's a, it's a voluntary participation by individual county jails, and we ask them to look at the current situation in their jail and, and figure out where the best opportunities lie for them to enhance um, connections for um, parents who are incarcerated. It is not a, a requirement, it is, not, it is voluntary participation, and each um, individual county jail can set the parameters that match both the security and the safety of, um, of the um, jail population and their staff. Um, so this would be a, you know, is really a, a program that allows maximum flexibility and, con and context um, in each individual site. I think there's a reference earlier on um, specifically talking about, you know, that this is not in uh, intended to, oh yes, I think it's on 46.14. Um, without compromising safety or security of the correctional facility. And so that, you know, that kind of scenario that you raised about what, what happens if the parent is a sex offender, um, those would be, you know, specific discussions with the individual county jail about which, um, which of the people who are incarcerated are eligible for this program. Um, those kind of standards are set by the individual um, county jail itself. Senator Lemmer, I might note it, it also says on 46.12 the, the policy is to remove barriers that might prevent children. It doesn't say that they must be forced to meet with anyone in the jail. Yeah. Uh, I noticed, Senator Lemmer. Mr. Chairman, that on line 14 that was just referenced, uh, the focus is on the safety and security of the correction facility. I'm bringing up the attention of the security and safety of the child. And maybe that should be an added reference to that. Um, the voluntary program by a county jail, is it a voluntary program that elicits a voluntary uh, activity by the child or the uh, guardian or the remaining parent at home? Is, is it a voluntary program by them as well? Can they step away from that if they deem that it's not appropriate to keep that healthy relationship. It also raises the question if, if there's a divorce or a, a estrangement by both parents. One's in jail and one doesn't want anything to do with that person in jail. Um, you know, who, who has, and a divorce hasn't been fully established, custody of child, the child hasn't been established either. Uh, what parent has 
the uh, or does a parent have in the jail have any authority to advance that potential relationship or not? Uh, it kind of raises a few questions in my mind, but um, maybe I just know how sticky uh, family law can be. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, uh, I just hope that we're not pressing too hard on this. Uh, can anyone give me some assurance? And, and is it written into the bill that it's going to be recognized by law? Senator Limmer, I can't imagine a model policy that would force a custodial parent against their will to deliver a child to the jail to see an incarcerated parent. What if the custody of the child has not been established? Well, as a practical matter, Senator Limmer, if one parent is incarcerated and the other parent is taking care of the child outside of the jail, someone's got custody and it's not the incarcerated parent. Um, so I. I'd have trouble seeing the practical right. impact here. Senator Wesson. Thank you, Senator Latz. I just want to sort of come back to the, the purpose of this and to address some of these issues as well. It states that the purpose of this is to support children of incarcerated parents and their caregivers. Um, we know that one of the adverse childhood experiences uh, includes having a parent who is incarcerated. I have certainly had family law cases where a parent has been in jail or incarcerated for one reason or another. And oftentimes what happens is that parent is just suddenly absent. There's no, there's no conversation around it. There's no um, explanation, you know, a, a, an age appropriate explanation. And so th what the child knows is that the parent's just gone. And if I understand what you're trying to do and I'm kind of read the, the plain language of the bill, it's really developing this is for the purpose of supporting the children and helping the, help uh, the jails develop a practice around that, which includes parenting classes or groups. Great things for a parent who, who's incarcerated. Um, and also a family-focused reentry plan, because on the other side of this, then, when the parent's been gone for a while and they're coming back, you know, there needs to be, again, an age-appropriate, um, um, informed approach of bringing that parent back into the home. And even in cases where parents divorced, uh, the parents are divorced, um, the child from our perspective, unless there's a danger of um, harm, uh, a history of abuse and so on, we do try to preserve parental relationships because we know that generally speaking, with some exceptions, that's going to be best for the child. And so um, I think Senator Latz is correct that if someone's in jail and someone's not in jail, the custodial parent is the person who has custody of the child. and, and you know, these may be some things, however, that if there are some model practices, part of the focus here is um, is also to help the caregivers of the child uh, as well. And so it, it just seems to me that this provides an opportunity um, to really support the child, to provide some support for the caregiver as well, um, to try and turn a situation that's very devastating often for kids to have a parent absent and, and provide some support. Is there any further discussion on the A-5 amendment? Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my questions are on Section 18, and I know you said that jurisdiction was uh, limited to 21.29 through... Yeah, let's focus on the data provision of it then, Senator Cruin. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe you said this morning that we won't pull every bill into our committee that only has civil penalties, but if the bill ends up in our committee, we can discuss those provisions that contain civil penalties. <laughs> so I believe that this entire section would fall with what, under the jurisdiction as you outlined it. Are you, you trying morning. to hoist me on my own petard here, Senator Cron? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> As long as I still have a gavel in my hand, I can throw it from the petard. 
Senator Cron. Thank you, Mr. Keep Chair. Keep in mind also it's five minutes to 11 p.m. I will, uh, I will be brief. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what would give rise to these civil penalties in Section 18 and clarify some of the language. Um, and we, uh, Mr. Selwood, I believe, testified on this provision and um, directing your attention to um, lines 21.12 through 21.15. Um, can you tell me what applicable to the next calendar year means? Does that mean that the uh, manufacturers have to report what the price is going to be for the following year? Is that, is, is that how that's interpreted? Can you, um, Mr. Chair, Senator 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 Kern, can you repeat the question, please? So the, when it says applicable to the next calendar year, I assume that means the following calendar year, which would mean if it's due on July 31st, it would mean five to 17 months out into the future. Am I understanding that correctly, the interpretation of that? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, that would be my interpretation as well. It wouldn't go from July to July, but January to December. Right. And so th Senator Cron. thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that response. So when they're reporting that price on July 31st, they're reporting, they're projecting apparently what the price is going to be five to 17 months in the future, as I understand it. And um, we heard testimony about um, how that is not practical and potentially not possible. And I'm just wondering if the chief author has given that, uh, disputes that, uh, whether or not it would be practical or possible to come up with that price that far out in advance. Senator Wickland. Mm, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Kroon, I, I think that this is um, adding to, or no, this is from Senate Bell, is this 328? 328, yep. I was thinking it was from the other uh, price transparency, but it's not. Um, so this is was not originally my bill that I was carrying, so I'm not necessarily as familiar with that level of detail. Um, so I would be speculating, I guess. I, I, since it's written that way, then I'm, I believe they have the intent that it would be um, possible for the manufacturer to be reporting that. Mr. Chair. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I mean, the testimony is that it, um, I believe, not practical, potentially not possible, and I don't, want to be putting civil penalties on an impossibility that doesn't seem fair. And it just seems like, you know, what would happen if there's some supply chain issue or some sort of issue during that five to 17 month period out in the future where the wholesale acquisition cost has to go up, what happens to the company at that point? And I believe under, in lines 2.2, 22.3 and 22.4, they would be subject to uh, disciplinary action, which could include a civil penalty of up to $10,000 per occurrence. So I think it's pretty important that what we're asking the manufacturers to do is not only possible but practical, and uh, setting a f price that far out in the future seems problematic to me. Um, but I'm going to move on to uh, lines 22.9 through 22.13. And it says that the manufacturer may increase the wholesale acquisition cost of the drug for the next calendar year only after providing the commissioner with at least 90 days notice. Can you tell me what 90 days notice before when? Or what's the, what's the uh, time period there that it's referring to? Senator Wickland. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Kroon, I was just looking, or we were just looking um, on subdivision four where the price change, um, is that, yeah, um, it gives some instructions. 
um, on how the, the reported price, um, the manufacturer may increase the whole, I, I think that gives some detail about what they can do if they don't have, I, I don't, I'll let the <laughs> Senate Council explain because I think I'm, I'm struggling here. <coughs> Thank Mr. you, Mr. Hodel. Chair, members of the committee. So uh, my reading of subdivision four in, con in conjunction with subdivision two is that um, based on that projection of the wholesale acquisition cost, uh, if the manufacturer, based on the drugs in their formulary, kind of disagree with that, with that projection, then they can work with the Commissioner of Commerce for the next calendar year to appropriately increase the wholesale acquisition cost of the drug. Um, they do have to provide 90 days written notice in order to do so, but it does at least give them the option, um, at least in my interpretation, to um, kind of correct for any deficiencies and, and work through it with uh, regulator, uh, regulatory authorities. Senator Crone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess that is one interpretation. That's exactly the question that I followed up with is what that 90 days actually means. Because another interpretation could mean that it's 90 days before the July 31st deadline referenced in subdivision two. Uh, and it just it adds another notice. So if you want to increase it for the following calendar year, you got to do it 90 days before July 31st. Or it could be the interpretation that you just outlined that it's 90 days before the calendar year um, that would take place sometime after July 31st, but 90 days before the calendar year. I think the language is very unclear what that means. And if we're talking about $10,000 civil penalty per occurrence, it seems like that language needs to be cleared up what the intent of that actually is, and then to make sure that the wording reflects that intent. Um, so we're not setting up these manufacturers to be in a state of confusion over what their requirements are. Um, and then, but even if your, interp your interpretation is the correct one, that's still 90 days before a calendar year. So it's not like they just, you know, if the price goes up, they just have to give 90 days notice and get permission to increase it. It's 90 days before the calendar year, so you're still talking 13 months out into the future instead of 17. So it's, it's marginally better, but it's still very problematic. Um, so if the intent is that they have an opportunity to raise that price with 90 days notice period, then that calendar year language should be removed. I don't know what the intent here is. I would prefer the latter to give some flexibility to the uh, manufacturers for market condition change that so they can have a 90 day notice where they can then get that price uh, increased and it doesn't necessarily have to be 90 days uh, before a calendar year. Those are my comments and anybody has any response? Um, go ahead. Senator Wickland or Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Huddle to that point? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Grun, I, I mean, I can I can go back and talk with the original, um, the bill author, and see if we can, um, if I can understand better what the intent was and how we might need to rephrase that. Unless you had some other suggestion or or comment about it. Well, I'm just not seeing a conflict between subdivision two and subdivision four. Okay. And subdivision four deals specifically with price changes on. Drugs already included in the formulary, and subdivision two applies uh, to other information, including price information uh, for a certain class of, of drugs. Doesn't talk about changing pricing or anything like that. Uh, so the way I read subdivision four, the 90 days written notice is 90 days before increasing the price. Manufacturer may increase the price or the cost with at least 90 days written notice. So price can't go up until 90 days after they've given the notice. That's that. Uh, That's true. But why does it then say for the next calendar year? Why is that language in there? It would give an opportunity then for the uh, commissioner to respond. Before the price goes up in the next calendar year, 
Mr. Chair. Senator Westenkopf. So it's talking about the calendar year for the health plan. And as Senator Latz, you already pointed out, this provision applies specifically where a formulary has been submitted to a health plan and approved for the next calendar year. Yeah. Like these are drug prices in a formulary approved by a health plan for the next year. And so the rest of that says, well, okay, but if you want to in, in, increase the, the, the cost for the next year, which has already been approved by the health plan, you have to provide 90 days notice. It, it, it seems pretty clear to me. Any other discussion on the A5 amendment? Mr. Chair, with all due respect, I don't think this language is clear at all. Um, where the 90 days, how they relate to one another, um, and even if it is clear and that's what it means, I think um, there needs to be some flexibility here for changes that occur within that year. But if it's clear to you all, then that's fantastic. Mr. Chair. Senator just, Westland. Just briefly, but the, the point is that the health plan has relied on a formulary that's been submitted to them regarding pricing. And so if they're going to then change the prices after they've submitted it, it's saying, you great, but you have to give notice in order to do that. And, you know, I think some of this comes down to wanting some transparency and some um, stability in the pricing so that they, once they've submitted a plan, um, they can't just change it without some sort of notice. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not disputing that there would be a notice provision. It's just that the notice provision should be written in a more clear way. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's nice to have some consistency, but that's just not the way the markets operate. You, you know, you, to set a price for that, you know, much in the future, um, it's just not the way that the, the industry works. And so we're trying to make it static when it's not static. The reality of the market is it's not static. I guess that's my point. Well, Senator Kroon, it sounds like in this regulated market, that's the reality of the market. Market is subject to the constraints of the regulation, and that's for a reason. And you may disagree as to whether that's a valid reason or not, but it does provide some price stability, which is a public purpose, I think, that's attempting to be advanced here. And I guess we can either agree with that or disagree with it. Um, all right, any further discussion on the A5 amendment? Senator Howe, I, your hand is up online. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, on eight, line 87.4, 87.4, they delete a premium schedule uh, that is to be provided, and I'm just wondering why why are we deleting that and not providing that premium schedule any longer? No, it's not. Um, if someone quickly knows the answer to that question, which doesn't seem to be within our jurisdiction, uh, we'll take an answer to the question. But we're not going to go too far down this rabbit hole. Senator Howell seems to like asking questions about provisions and bills that are not within our jurisdiction. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I kind of missed that piece where we went through the exactly what was in the... Uh, in the in our scope, so I apologize for that. Uh, that's fine. We seem to have someone here who knows the answer to the question. So, ma'am, go ahead and introduce yourself and answer the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Tara Borton, Department of Human Services Child Support Division. Um, that language is re-added further on in the bill. So, um, and I apologize, I didn't have time to look up exactly um, the line, but that is not coming out. That was just a sort of reorganization. But thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Any other discussion relating to the A5 amendment? Seeing none. So what we need to do procedurally here, members, is add the A6 to the A5. So Senator Westland, 
moves. Is that okay? No? Okay, yes. <laughs> Senator Westland moves that the A6 amendment uh, be added to the A5 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. The motion passes. The amendment is adopted. Now we have the A5 amendment as amended by the A6 amendment, which also contains its own amendments. Um, oh, to which we want to add one other uh, provision uh, that uh, council be directed to make conforming and technical changes to reflect the changes made in this committee. Uh, um, when, when the uh, language is updated in Senate file 2995. That's correct. All right. So that would be the ultimate motion here for the A5 amendment. Is there any confusion on that language? <laughs> So Senator Westland moves that the A5 amendment, as amended by the A6 amendment, and as amended otherwise during this committee proceeding, to which also will be added the direction to council to make conforming and technical changes, et cetera, uh, be adopted. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Now we have... Senate file 1681, um, as amended by the A5 and all of its attendant amended language. And uh, is it better to do a committee report to engross this? Or just lay it over? I think it's better to lay it over because otherwise engrossing has to do all this work. Okay. So, members, what we're going to do now, having conducted our judiciary hearing and fixed all of the language that we think needs to be fixed uh, as a result of this hearing. Uh, we've given, given clear direction to council and whoever is going to draft up the final bill and the, whatever bill is moving forward here with this language. So we can lay this onto the table, or lay it over, rather. So we will lay Senate file 1681 as amended over. That concludes our work on Senate File 1681. That also concludes our work on our agenda for today. Members, thank you for your patience and for your long work. Uh, yes, the advantage of getting this done now is we will not have a judiciary hearing on Friday, but we will be on the floor. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Senator Limmer. Mr. Chairman, could you give us a little idea of uh, future Judiciary Committee hearings? Are we planning on having an ongoing meeting until May, or uh, when do you think that might end? Uh, Senator Limmer, we're going to have a special hearing June 1st to consider all the bills we didn't have time to take up before deadlines and adjournment at the end of session. Great. Uh, we will be meeting next week, uh, Monday for sure, possibly Wednesday. Um, we have a couple of late bills that we're still going to have to hear, and we also have some mini policy omnibus, our actual policy omnibus bills to advance, which will also technically be late, um, but we'll let rules sort that out. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so uh, Monday and quite possibly Wednesday of next week. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, does the majority, uh, do they... It seems like they are not formally recognizing policy deadlines with uh, a number of numerous late bills. And uh, uh, will that be, uh, is that a new policy or new policy direction by the majority party? It seems like it's happening in all the committees, uh, contrary to what our tradition has always been. Senator Limmer, I cannot speak on behalf of leadership or the majority to answer that question. All right. That's fair. Thank you. All right. There being no further business to come before the Judiciary Committee tonight, we are adjourned.